We continue our series of um, fund manager video interviews um, as we're joined by Dan Roberts um, from Fidelity. Dan, thanks very much for joining us. Dan runs the Fidelity Global Dividend Fund. Um, and I thought maybe just to kick off, um, would you maybe explain the, the key objectives of the fund, what you're, what you're trying to achieve um, with the Global Dividend Fund? Yeah. So I would consider the approach, I would call the approach a dividend-based total return strategy. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean, I'm looking to deliver my unit holders uh, a relatively attractive headline yield, uh, but importantly a dividend as well, which can grow over time. Uh, and beyond that, there's, a, there's a, a focus on capital preservation within the portfolio as well. So a very conservative attitude to risk. All in all, that should mean uh, a portfolio that across a market cycle outperforms and where periodic drawdowns or, or losses uh, are much less than, uh, than a passive strategy. Okay, how would you say your approach differentiates itself with other global equity income managers? Yeah, it's a difficult question to answer because within the global equity income peer group there are lots of different styles and strategies, but uh, a couple of things I would draw out. First of all, how we think about dividends and the dividend profile of the fund. What I would say there is that dividends are really at the core of our approach, the heart of what we do, um, but we don't look to indiscriminately allocate to the highest yield in sectors in the market. So. You know, we, we don't want to compromise in the underlying quality of the dividend stream which is underpinning that yield. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, I mentioned already about our conservative attitude to risk, so a, a focus on capital preservation. That pervades everything we do. So the valuations of stocks we invest in, the types of companies we invest in, and how we put the portfolio together. So that's another thing I would point out. And then finally, um, the unconstrained nature of the portfolio. It's a genuinely actively managed fund. Uh, there can be no allegations of benchmark hugging here. Uh, the active risk is, is, is quite high at 90%, uh, and it's a portfolio of about 50 stocks from different sectors and different geographies. Okay. One of the key features you say is, um, from your approach is that you're looking to buy from pessimists and then sell to optimists. I wondered how that works in practice, and also how that translates to your, your market outlook at the current time over the maybe medium term. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I use that. It's a very simplistic phrase, I guess, but it goes to the heart of what we try to do. Uh, and it talks to the fact that I think if inefficiencies in the market arise because of behavioural biases. Um, there are many such behavioural biases, but a big one is, um, or one we see time and time again, is that analysts and market participants extrapolate recent history uh, over in, in, into the foreseeable future. And that can get you into trouble at turning points in the market. Um, and, and, and means that valuations uh, in the market uh, and risk-seeking tendencies tend to be quite pro-cyclical. Uh, so when share prices are high, everybody's quite buoyant and, and you know, allocates to equities, which is uh, arguably the wrong thing to do at that time. Um, and that can translate into individual stocks as well, as well as, well as the wider market. Uh, so we look to buy stocks when they're out of favour, when expectations are low, when valuations are low, and therefore the risk reward is heavily stacked in your favour and is asymmetric, is the word I like to use in that regard. In terms of how that translates into my thoughts on the market at the moment, well, what I would say is that you know, we've come from a place two years ago where many people had uh, several risks in the forefront of their minds. So I'm thinking you know, Eurozone crisis, you know, fiscal cliff in the US, fears of a hard landing in China. I think many of those risks now have been priced out of the market as we've seen the market rise. A lot of people are more comfortable with those risks. But as a result, I think it's, it's sensible to be more cautious at this period of time because that's, of course, been reflected in share prices which are considerably higher than they were two years ago. So incrementally more cautious. Uh, and I would, but I would still expect the asset class to deliver returns to beat, for example, bonds or, you know, or, or other asset classes that people can invest in out there. Sure. One thing that we think is important when we're looking at funds um, at Killick & Co is, is the level of um, alignment that the fund manager has with their, with their other unit holders. I wondered if you wouldn't mind going into how you and your team are, are personally incentivised on the fund. Yep. Uh, well, there's three main, main methods of incentivization, and the first thing to say is that they're all based on long-term metrics, so that's an important point to get across by long-term, I mean at least three years, predominantly five years, five years is the key metric for us. So the main metrics are um, our annual bonus is based on performance, uh, and I should say we don't get anything if we don't beat the, 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 our benchmarks, that's the first point to make. Um, we're also awarded periodically Fidelity shares, now Fidelity is a private company. Uh, but those shares vest over five years, so again, a long, very long-term focus there. Uh, and perhaps most importantly for your unit holders is the fact that I'm invested alongside them, so a good proportion of my own wealth is invested in the fund. 
Okay. Just one final question. Um, I thought it may be interesting to, to take a look at one stock that you think maybe is, is overlooked by the market or is um, particularly good value at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, you we might, might as well take one of the biggest holdings in the fund, which is Walters Kluwer. Um, I'm not sure if many of the, the readers or watchers will actually have heard of that uh, stock. It's a, it's a European publisher, a professional publisher. Very attractive end markets. But it has, the market has fallen out of love with this stock over the last 10 years. The reason why is because 10 years ago, much of its business was print-based. And as it's had to make that transition to, to digital-based digital revenues, uh, it's faced quite a significant headwind in terms of its revenue progression. So as a result, the rating and the valuation of the stock has come down quite considerably. Now, they've reacted to that by making acquisitions of digital businesses, uh, but they've had to pay quite a high price for those acquisitions. So it's kind of it's damaged returns on capital. But as we sit here today, 75% of their business now uh, is, is non-print, so digital-based or software-based revenues. And I think from here, that headwind that I talked about is abating, and we can start to look forward to a period of better top-line growth from this company. And as a result, I would expect the market you know, to reassess the investment case for the, for the stock. Now, it offers a, a, a yield, a dividend yield of a little under 4% today. I would expect mid-single-digit mid, mid dividend growth from, 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 the, uh, from the stock and some potential for a you know, modest valuation accretion as well to get you to, you know, to a good double-digit total return from that stock over the medium, return, medium term from here. Okay, great. Dan Roberts, thanks very much for your time today. If you'd like any um, further information on the Fidelity Global Dividend Fund, uh, please contact your broker for a copy of our recent um, research notes.